this presentation entitled Don't Bite Off More Than You Can Chew, Take It In Chunks. There might have been a time way back then, you were very new to your school and you asked someone else who was more experienced than you, I have this table, I need to loop over it, how do I do that? And that person looked at you and smiled and said, no, no, in your school, you don't write loops. You see, you write set-based statements, you work with all data at once. And as you progress with SQL, you come to appreciate those set-based statements. You come to love them. But every once in a while, maybe you saw that really big table and you thought, hmm, should I really work with all data at once? And maybe you should not, because maybe if you did, you would bite more off than you, and more importantly, SQL Server could chew. So maybe you should take it in chunks. My name is Alan Somasco. I live in Stockholm, where I work as an independent consultant. I've been an MVP for SQL Server for many years. I have a website, somewhere which you where you find a, well, a small collection of large articles that goes in depth in a couple of topics. My email address is there, sqr.sumasco.se, and you're more than welcome to reach out to me if you have any questions about this session that you're doing a dance in today. Oh, yeah, by the way, I should point out, in case you don't know, you are listening to a recording and watching a recording, and the idea is that while this recording is running, I will be monitoring the Q&A chat, and so if you put your questions there while the session is running, I will either, either answer them directly in the chat window or say them at the end where there will be a 50 minutes live Q&A. Slides and scripts for this presentation, you can find them on my website, soasco.se slash present, they are there. And they should also be at the uh, site for the Data Platform Summit. This is my agenda for today. So I'd like to start to talk about two scenarios where we could use chunking. And here, with the cryptic, sub cryptic subtitles, don't bite off more than you can chew and be nice to others. I will then talk about how to implement chunking. Talk about, well, performance, pitfalls, things you have to watch out for. And this will be the main meat of the presentation. And the last thing I will talk about is how we could use chunking for, to improve error handling. And here, with the cryptic subtitle, when all or nothing is not what you want. So say this, you have a table. And you're going to perform an operation on that entire table, or at least the better part of it. So, for instance, you have an int column, which is, which is the key column, and you think, oh, no, no, my business is going to go. We did big int here. Of course, you could do that with all the table. But you might decide, now, I'd rather create a new version of the schema and copy all data over with an insert statement. Or it could be that you, were added a new, you have added a new column to that table, and now you want to initialize that column for all rows by, well, with some constant or taking values from some other tables. Or it could be that you want to, well, not delete all rows, but maybe let's say 50 or 90% of the rows. But let's say this, this table has a size of 300 gigabytes. Now what would happen if you were trying to do that in one single operation? Hey, it could be your lucky day and everything could go just fine. But it's very likely that you would experience things like, well, the transaction log starts to grow violently and eventually overflow to the disk in time. Or the same thing could happen with tempdb, both the data and the log file, because maybe your operation requires you to fill temp tables, or there are plans with spool operators or hash builds, sort builds, etc. Another thing to keep in mind is the, the buffer cache on the RAM. Let's say that this table is, well, exceeds the available RAM with a factor of X. Well, if it's just a single scan, not really much of a problem, is because server will read the first couple of rows into the cache, and when it comes up to in some part of the table, these rows will fall out of the cache again. But let's now say the operation requires this server to come back and read the same row multiple times, and every time has to read it from disk. That is not great. Uh, and al also a thing to consider is, what if there ha has to be a rollback? Because maybe if something goes wrong, maybe something crashes, or you decide that it was the wrong operation in the first place. Well, the rollback, if it's just one single operation, can also take a very, very long time. The remedy for all of this problem is to split up the work in chunks, work on subset of the data at the time, marrying those loops you wanted to write as a small kid where they're doing set-based operations. Now, obviously, you should keep the chunk size small enough so you don't get, you don't run into, into these problems with the log, log file and attempt to be and everything else. But at the same time, this is important. Don't make the chunks too small because the chunking will add overhead and bigger chunks are more efficient. Okay, so you are now asking yourself, how many rows should I have in my chunk? And you know the answer already, don't you? It depends. It depends on a whole lot of things. First of all, I mean, what is the current size of your log file and temp to be? Hey, let's say you have a 300 gigabyte table and the log file is already 10 terabyte. Well, maybe then the log file is not a problem. 
Also, don't only look at the number of rows. The number of pints is also important. You maybe have, only have one million rows in your table. But there is a lob column in that table with an average size of one megabyte. You're going to work on that lob column. You are looking at one terabyte of data. You probably need to split up that work in chunks. But never, all this and all this, and I have a kind of standard value for my own, that it's far million rows. I, this, and it's not taken out of, out, right out of thin air. So a couple of years back, I was working at my client and I was making a change to a table that had like well, 45, 50 columns. And I decided that now I want to copy all the data over in a loop doing chunking. As a matter of fact, I actually had a tool to generate this, but I wanted to test what is a good chunk size. And I found that when going from 500,000 rows to 5 million rows, I still gain performance by, well, 10, 15%. And then I actually stopped there. But as I say here, your mileage may vary. So take this value with a big grain of salt. Now, even if you do chunking, that doesn't uh, mean that you can forget about the transaction log. You would still produce a lot about the transaction log. Well, if you can afford to be in simple recovery, maybe you can, because then it's because so will truncate the long on every checkpoint. But how often can you run simple recovery in production? Not very often. And I absolutely recommend against putting the database in simple recovery just because you're going to do, because you're going to do a large operation. Because that could prove to be a very, very bad move if you have hidden corruption in the database. Don't do that. Never. So if you are in full recovery, you need to, you need to think about the transaction log. Because let's say you only back up normally the transaction log every 15 or 30 minutes. Well, in 15 minutes or even 30 minutes, you can definitely cause the log to explode. So you might have to increase the back frequency, backup frequency, to maybe even once every minute. Um, could I add backup log to my chunking script? Isn't that easier? <sighs> no, I'm not sure. Well, if you write the log, if you write the backups to the same place and the same name convention as the scheduled log backups do, yes, then you can do it. But if you write it elsewhere and someone needs to apply those logs later on, that will just cause a nightmare. So it's better, I think, to just keep the regular job, but just increase the frequency. Now, so far, I talked about the scenario where you more or less have the database to run, like you're working the maintenance winner to do, well, let's say, alter the scheme or make some big change of all the data in the table. But uh, being nice to others, this is a different scenario where, well, it's probably a smaller operation, maybe, maybe only five million rows in total. So you could do it in a single step, but you're now in a live system so that you have to think about other uses. If you would do all these five million rows at the same time, maybe you would take up too much resources in terms of CPU memory. And also very likely you would cause blocking and or deadlocks. And again, the remedy is to split up the operation in chunks, but this time with a fairly small chunk size. This means that yes, your operation will be less efficient, but the overall system health will be better. Now in this scenario, there is, well, kind of a magic number. And I said kind of a magic number because there can be more than one reason why you want to be nice to others. Sometimes locking is not an issue, it's only the matter of resources, etc. But let's say that locking is an issue. Let's say you're doing a purge operation on the table and you're going to purge away rows on the left side of the table. At the same time, users are working on the right side of the table over here to do point lookups mainly on the new data. So you might know that as Coursera takes more than 5,000 locks on the table, it likes to escalate that to to it being table lock. And that would be bad because now you would block all these uses. So you can uh, avoid this by running a test operation with different chunk sizes, and then you can look at your logs in system trial logs. And here's a demo of how to do this. So <clears throat> I got a database called Big Debate, and there's a table called Big Traps. I'm gonna talk a little bit more of this later. And here I'm just, that's normal, you would have a where clause here, but I don't have it because it's just a simple demo. So I'm just deleting 2,500 rows from this table. And then I'm looking at what sort of thing am I locking? In what way am I trying to lock it? The ID for it, and it could be a, t a, a table name, so then I get the table. And then also, how many locks do I have of this type? So let's run this. And you can see, first of all, that's one share lock on the database. Then there are key locks on two different things, and I can tell these are two different indexes. And there's 2,500 of each, because these are row locks. They are exclusive, but they are row locks over here on the left side of the table, they are good. Now you might be a little bit worried because there is also a lock on the table level, but this is a so-called intent lock, IX, which means basically, hey, I'm down here somewhere doing work. Uh, this lock will block a user that's trying to take a shared lock on the entire table. But in many, in many contexts, this lock is not a problem. 
And the same goes for the page locks, which also means I'm working down here on this page. So this, I would say, could be as pro is likely to be a case scenario. But let's now look at what happens if I change this to 3000. I now only have two locks, one on the shared on the database and one big fat lock on the table. So this, in this case, 2,500 was my sweet spot and 3,000 was too much. So to repeat, when you do this operation, you should only see X locks on key and bridge resources. Key, those are index keys, that, that is row locks, and RID is where you have a heap, That's these rows are row, row locks. If you see X log on objects, well, then your chunk size is too big. If you see X log on pages, it could be that your chunk size is too big, but it could also be that well, maybe your wear clause, your wear conditions, and your indexes do not really align, so it's conservative things. Ah, no, I'd rather take the lock on page level this time. But the IX locks on object to page, they are usually okay, because they are only telling I'm in it somewhere. Now, <clears throat> chunking does come with some challenges. It's not that chunking is like, extremely difficult. It's not like going on a multi-day hike, big adventure. You need to bring overnight equipment. You need to bring food. You need to bring maybe, well, emergency equipment, all sorts of stuff. No, no, but it's not really a walk in the park either. It's, well, you could say it's like a forest walk. You need sturdy shoes. Uh, you may have now have to negotiate a stream or two. You could slip on a stone. You could trip on a branch. So first of all, you need to write more code. And this means that it's more code that can have bugs and there's more code to test. That is just the way it is. You need to think about how is the application affected? How could you use React if they see some partially processed data? And what if my work is interrupted halfway through? How would I deal with this? And most of all, performance. If you do your chunking wrong, it can be such a big disaster that it would have been better if you hadn't done chunking at all. And I will talk and elaborate these things a little bit in more or less the opposite order that you see them on the slide. So let's start with performance. So here is a chunking operation. So what I'm doing here, I've added a, a column, column called new column to some big table. And I want to initialize it with some value. And I'm just saying, looping, as long as my, I do it on full chunks, I say update top, top chunk size, some big table, and where new column is not. Now, and I go with the chunks as a farming in rows. Now, do you think this is a good chunking operation or not? Think about that for a second while I get some water. No, this is not a good chunk operation. The first chunk will be fine. Because it's conserver will or the optimized well, SQL Server will find immediately five million routes. Bang! Update those. But next iteration of all, it will first have to go wait through all these five million rows to find the next five million. And next next time it will have to scan 50 million rows to find five million updates. And next time 20 million, etc. 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 Well, unless there is an index of new column, but then it will also have to maintain that index, which is also costly. So this brings us to this. Index and index is extremely critical when you do chunking. You must always define your chunks so they work over an index column. Now, if we go back to that operation on the previous slide, let's say that there had been no chunking at all. Well, then it would have been one single scan, and that's okay, particularly for that operation where we're gonna do it on the entire table anyway. But let's now say that with the chunk size is such that we get 500 chunks. Well, in this case where the chunks get, where the scans get bigger and bigger and bigger, this is equivalent to doing 250 scans. Well, 250 times slower, no, that's not good at all. Well, maybe not 250 times slower because we maybe would reduce, avoid some of these explosions that I mentioned, but nevertheless, it's not going to be good. So we have to use an index. And furthermore, I say this, the larger your chunk size is, the more important is to use the clustered index. Let's say you're gonna do some operation with a big chunk size found in your rows, and oh, oh, I'm gonna do this chunking over this non-clustered index. And the optimizer looks at this and thinks, wait a minute, five million kilocups? That's Extremely expensive. No, no, I'm going to scan the table. So it's really better to do that on the clustered index. And particularly if you're going to work on the entire table, because after all, you would never dream of going through the entire table by scanning a non-clustered index and doing a key lookup for every row. That's, oh, that's really expensive. Now, if you're going to work with smaller chunk sizes and only use some part of the table, now a non-clustered index may work, but then again, five million rows, that's still five million key lookups. Now, in the end though, there might be business logic or joints that affect which index you're going to use. Business logic, for example, let's say you're going to purge rows based on the date and maybe there is an index in that date column. So maybe you will work on that column. And joints to other tables, well, uh, I'm going to show an example of that later on, but this can matter. So 
Uh, before we go on, I'd like to talk a little bit more about this table, Big Trans, so you know, since we're going to work with it a little bit with it. I got this table from Adam Mechanic. He has a blog post called Big Adventure Works. So it has 31 million rows. It has a size of 2.2 gigabytes. There is a transaction ID, which is the primary key. It's an integer. That's a product ID, which is a foreign key. It's another table. And there's three more columns, all nullable. And there's a non clustered index on the product ID and transaction date. And for a later reference, observe there's no index where the transaction date is a leading column. Now, what we're going to do here, or what I thought, ah, my business is going to go, I need big in for this table. And then I thought, why is this data when all, there's only date only in that column, etc. And I also want the column not dots. That's the change I want to make. So I thought, well, I could try this with all the table. Well, that meant, first of all, I had to drop the primary key in the non clustered index to be able to change the primary key code. And then I had to run four all the table, all the column statements, all rebuilding the table. And I had to run them four of them because you can only order one column at the time. This took 984 seconds and the transaction log grew by, transaction log grew by 20 gigabytes, starting with a log of 700 megabytes. Okay, maybe then I should create a new table called new trans. And I did it that way. I had it when I started, I had the clustered index in place, but not the foreign key in the non-clustered index. Copied all rows over in a single statement and created the foreign key in the non-clustered index at the end. Because I did test to see that this was the fastest way to do it. This took six to eight seconds, so that it was a lot faster. The transaction log still grew by seven gigabytes. Can we improve this further by doing chunking? Well, that is what we're going to try. And I'd like to introduce you to a generic way to drive chunks. Now, you're looking here at the start of a store procedure, which takes the chunk size as a parameter. Now, this particular part is not really the token of best practice. It's maybe not bad either, but I have a procedure because I ran lots of tests, and that's also because I ran tests with different chunk sizes. It was practical for me to have the chunk size as a parameter. But <clears throat> in practice, you might want to just write a script, and you might hard code the chunk size. That would be perfectly all right. Now, I got these variables here, uh, min ID and max ID. Those are the boundaries for my chunks. And I found the, uh, the starting point for my first chunk by getting the min transaction ID from this table. And then I keep on looping as long as at, at min ID is not null. And then I run this uh, subquery here over big trans. I'm saying it select top of chunk size from transaction ID, where transaction ID is greater than at min ID, or by transaction ID ascended. So this will give me all the transaction ID will, will, which will be in this chunk. And then I'm grabbing the max value out of them. And then I can simply run an insert statement here, insert new trans, select all these columns from big trans, where transaction ID between these, these two chunk boundaries. And then at the end of the loop, I found which is the start of my next chunk by getting min transaction ID from big trans, where transaction ID is greater than at max ID. And then I keep on looping, and then when this one returns null, this means that I'm done, and I recreate the non clustered index and the foreign key. Before we go on and look at the data, the performance data I got, I like to dwell on this a little bit. In this particular table, big trans, the transaction ID are actually, the transaction IDs are actually perfectly contiguous. So I could have just simply said at max ID is equal at min ID plus chunk size minus one. And you might think, well, that must be a lot faster than doing this top subgroup. And indeed, for the bigger chunk sizes, well, five, ten percent, not more, in okay? game. Actually, for the smallest chunk size, this tended to be faster. Don't ask me why, but it was like five, ten percent. But let's now say the transaction IDs are not contiguous, there are plenty of gaps. Well, doing that max ID equals min ID plus chunk size minus one. I Maybe I will get a chunk with three rows in it. Now, that is not very good. So this, this pattern works also when there are lots of gaps. And not only that, it works with, well, let's say the transaction ID would be, would, would be a string, or a date, or a float, or a grid. It would, works on any data type you can put an index on. No problem, because the pattern is perfectly generic. And let's say the transaction ID is actually non-unique. Well, it still works, at least to some extent, and I, some extent, and I will come back to that later on. Now, so this is the data I got, and I like to remind you that the times you see here including, includes um, restoring the foreign key of the non clustered index, which somehow, well, well, diminishes a little bit the relations between the numbers. So anyway, you can see here, uh, the smaller chunk sizes really came with a penalty, although we're going to see soon how we can improve this. Um, we can also see this, as long as my chunk size was below 1 million, the transaction log did not grow, except for the very smallest chunk size where it grew a little bit. Don't know why really, I haven't dug into this. Um, 
Now, as for actually gaining some of this from this chunk here, this is not extremely clear, but we can see there is a sweet spot here at one million rows, which seems to be the fastest. It's still faster than doing 200 rows, and maybe also faster than doing 6 million rows, where we have to pay a penalty for growing the transaction log. Recall then that SQL Server spends time on zeroing out the log, and it's absolutely faster than doing all at once. But keep in mind, this is only a 2 gigabyte table, and in production, in real life, you wouldn't dream of doing chunking of such a small table. But this table is big to be a demo table. It's still, well, maybe not small, but it's still moderate to be a production table. Also, I should say this is data from my laptop. And if you if you would try this in your environment, you could get different results. I should say I ran my test with simple recovery to keep it simple. So if you were trying with full recovery, you could see some quite different. As a matter of fact, uh, this is data that I got last year when I first composed this session. So it was like in March 2016. And... Yeah, this year I got slightly different. I will talk more about that later on. Um, but I kept these numbers for reasons that will prevail. So anyway, <clears throat> there's one thing we need to keep in mind here. The optimizer compiles the entire procedural batch at once. So therefore, it does not know the values of, of at min ID and max, max ID. And it will, it will simply make a blind assumption about the hit rate, which I believe is 9% for a between condition. Now, this can affect performance quite a bit, not the least if you're joined to other tables of any size. This happened to me some time back. I was working at the client. I'm making, I was making, well, I was working with a computation that used a table and I needed, I need more columns in this table. So I, well, added these columns, developed an update script with copying all the data. That worked fine for me because in my test database, I only had 25, sorry, 20,000 rows. But eventually my client sent it out to their customers. And when they was trying this first in a, in a test environment, uh, well, it took 12 hours in one site. And I think another site they gave up after 24 hours. And this caused me a bit of a problem because I was not working very much for that client anymore. So I didn't really have that much time to look at the situation. But before I actually had the time to do that, another guy at that site, at that site a sharp guy, said, well, why don't you try up to recompile? <laughs> Boom, that was it. Now it took 20 minutes to do that operation that had taken 24 hours, which for this case was perfectly okay. So this is a real winner because now the optimizer knows about the values and can make a lot better choice about the plan. Now, obviously, this is good for a chunk size of farming in rows, for example. Maybe that takes, let's say, half a minute to process each chunk. And it takes 50 milliseconds to compile. That's not an overhead. But let's now say you have a chunk size of 1,000 rows, and that takes, well, let's say, 50 milliseconds to process, and it still takes 50 milliseconds to compile. Now that comes be quite a bit of an overhead. But there is another option, and that is to push the operation into an inner bound to an inner scope. So the chunk boundaries become parameters. Like for example, in an inner stop procedure, uh, inner stop procedure doesn't really sound appealing maybe in this context, but there's another trick. You can use dynamic scale. So here, what I've done here is I put this operation here in dynamic scale for the only reason to make admin ID and max ID parameters. So now the first time this, ex uh, this runs, the optimizer can Sniff the input values and optimize the plan for these, for these, uh, for these values. And hopefully then that is a plan that can be reused and which is good for all chunks in the operation. Now, you might think here that, well, it, in this case, it can't really matter because this is such a simple thing. Uh, big trans, this is the clustered index. There's no other choice of plans. So nothing can go wrong. We don't need this here. Yeah, I thought so too, but look here what happened. I got a drastic improvement with dynamic scale. The execution time was improved with a factor of three for a chunk size of a thousand rows. The plan is the same. I don't know what's going on, but it must be something that does not expose in the plan. Something down there, some, some internal things. I even got an, also got an improvement by option, using option recompile at least for a thousand rows, although not as big because I had to pay for the compilation overhead and for five thousand rows, it was actually slightly slower than having nothing at all. And then, yeah, yeah, this is a little bit embarrassing for me. Um, here, I mean, for six million rows, that's only seven reco uh, recompilations. So that is not recompilation overhead. Now, what happens here is that there is a small difference in the plan, actually, and that apparently that optimization backfires. Now, the data you see here is what I got last year running on SQL 2016 at the build that was current at that time. Now, in September this year, I reran the test both on SQL 2019 and SQL 2016. And well, 
Uh, it was not equally startling. It was still the same kind of difference, but it was like this was about one in the 45 seconds, and this was actually, I think, one in the five seconds. So it was still a difference, but not as big. But I kept these numbers because they were more remarkable, so to speak. Now, I also tested this kind of chunking on a different operation. What I've done here is that I got this table called Big Orders, 5.1 million rows, one gigabyte in size, and I've added a new column called Total Amount. And which I initialized by taking values from both from the table itself and from the big details table, uh, 50 million rows, 3.8 gigabyte in size. And so you can see here, because it's a join, there's a certainly a more complex operation and there's a more choice of plants. So let's see now what happens when I do this chunking using uh, no hint at all or nothing at all, option recompile or dynamic scale. I get, oh, dynamic scale is a lot slower than doing nothing at all or an option recompile. What is this? Hmm. Yeah, I had to scratch my head when I, when I looked at this, but I did find out the reason. So, the big trans table has perfect statistics. They have been created with full scan, but big orders, as it turned out, had sample statistics, and the lowest ID in the histogram was only 13,063. So this means that for these two smaller chunk sizes, while well, the first chunk was entirely outside the histogram, so the optimizer thought, hmm, one row, one row, I guess one row. And then it optimized the plan, which was good, which was good for one row, but not really for thousand or five thousand rows. Now once, yeah, so that was what I said right there. So once the chunk size was so big that the fit, so the 25,000 rows, so that the upper limit was inside the histogram, well, the optimizer made a lot better choice. And for this 25,000 rows, I even got better performance with doing no hint at all. But now there is a way we can deal with this situation. I can do update statistics with full scan on the particular index I'm using for the chunking. Not on the, just saying update, update statistics, big orders with full scan, because in that case, it would do update statistics with full scan. Well, on for every column with statistics in the table, including all those with auto stats with no index on them at all. And that's one full table scan for each such column. That takes a very long time. And anyway, the times you see here includes doing update statistics. Now, whether you should always do this, I'm, I'm a little bit on the fence about this because, I, first of all, I don't know what happens with the 300 gigabyte tables. Maybe, maybe it takes just too long time. And, but maybe you should do this if you know you're going to operate on the entire table from start to end. If you know that you're going to start in the middle, there's no reason to do this because then apparently I would guess statistics should be okay. Anyway, this is one thing to watch out for. But the, now we're going, on the next slide, we're going to see why we actually want to use them and re, SQL or recompile. They are safeguards. Now we're going to see data for the same operation, for the same sort of set of tables, except now this time the orders table has the clustered index on the custom ID and the primary key is non clustered. Now look here, when having nothing at all, no option recompile, no dynamic scale, we have complete disasters for the smaller chunk sizes. So that is really the point of using dynamic scale or recompile. Now, in practice, you may not care whether it takes 96 sec seconds or 120 sec uh, 27 seconds, or for that matter, 96 minutes or 127 minutes. But you don't want 4,300 or 1,700, whatever that is. That is what you want to avoid. So that is the reason you, you, you should use any of these as a matter of routine to avoid these problems. In passing, we can note here, make an uh, interesting observation here. So I said previously, we should do the chunking over the clustered index but which in this case is the custom ID, and this is the non clustered index. But you can see this is actually slightly faster in this case. And the reason for this, I haven't looked into the plans, but I would, it's quite clear it has to be because we joined into the big details table, which still has the clustered index on the, over, on the order ID. So we align it better to that table. So this is why joins could affect your choice of index. And speaking of big details, we're gonna stay on that table and talk about multi-column keys. So big details has the, uh, the primary key and the clustered index on order ID and product ID, and there can be up to 600 products by order. So let's say we need to do an operation on this table. How do how would we do chunking over that one? Just ignore the product ID and run the top order over or ID only? Yeah, I mean, let's say we go for chunks as a 5 million rows. Yeah, we could get some chunks with 5 million 600 rows in it. Not a big deal. Well, well even if you, get, if you have a chunk as a 50,000 rows, still not a big deal. So, yeah, we could. In many cases, we could, we, could, we could ignore that. And yes, you want to stick to this pattern as long as you can, because alternatives are not really palatable. 
But of course, let's say that could be 10,000 produce per order and you must strictly stay within a chunk size of 1,000 rows because else you, you have to be nice to others and th more than 1,000 rows could get you into problems with locking. Now, obviously, you need something else. Okay, but could we, couldn't we just take that top loop and extend it to two or more keys? Maybe. Well, let's have a look at this. And I should give you a warning. So um, this may be a little bit going to happen here. It's going to be maybe be a little too fast paced for you, but there is a kind of point in that. So first of all, we have update price simple. And this is the pattern we have seen before. So this is just ignoring the product of the entirely. I get the main ID as the smallest order ID from B details. Keep on looping as long as not and all. Doing this top subquery, capturing the max, doing operation, which in this case is very silly. I'm just multiplying the unit price by 1.2. I have optional recompile as a matter of routine and get the next main ID by, well, the order is greater than max ID. Well, let's now say I really need to stay within my chunk size and not enlarge it. So here comes update price double where I take care of this. So I get more variables. I get a min or ID and a max, sorry, min or ID and a min product ID. I get a max or ID and a max product ID. I also have a stop or ID and a stop product ID and a variable called game over. So first of all, I get the starting point and I can't use min here because I want the, well, the smallest order ID and the smallest product ID on that order. So I use top one with the order ID ascending and I also want the highest order ID and the highest product ID on that order. And then I keep on looping as long as game over is not null, not, sorry, not zero. I start the loop by setting these max order and max product ID to null explicitly for reasons I will, will prevail in a second. Then I run, again, I select top subquery to find all the keys for this chunk. So this means order order ID is, is equal to min order ID and all the products greater than this, this smallest order ID on this particular order. And then I'm also looking at all order greater than min order ID. I'm using row number here because I can't use max. I can't use max. So to get the upper chunk size in an efficient way, I use row number to get the numbering and I pick the one where the row number is equal to the chunk size and that gives me the upper bound bit of my chunk. Except in the case that I'm at the last chunk because then there will be the row number equal to the chunk size which will leave these two unchanged. And that is why I set them to null up here. So anyway, max or at least null. This means I've come to the end of the loop. Game over equals one and I set them here, here to the stop or ID, which I picked up in the beginning. Now, I'm going to do my update, but I have to consider a few cases here. First of all, did I move to a new order? Yes, in that case, well, all the remaining products of that order, all the orders in between up to the last order in the chunk and the first couple of products on that last order. So combined here with all. But then it might also be that I'm staying within the same order. So then, okay, order ID is equal to min order ID and the product in this range. And I'm sure you can find in both places. And if game over is not zero, I need to find the starting boundary for the next chunk by doing this top one query. Now, when I tested this, I found that performance was not very good at all. And the reason for this are these all conditions, because the optimizer, well, did not do a good job. It optimizer rarely does a good job when all is involved. So I had to make, come up with update price triple. And what the difference is here is that these update statements with all conditions are now split up in three ones. And now the performance is starting to get better. Now, as I said, maybe this was a little too quick for you, but there is a kind of point in that I don't like these solutions. I think these are too complex. I mean, this was two keys. Just imagine this with three of, or four or five keys. So I'm kind, I'm kind of inclined to look for alternatives. So this is what I like to call the big temp table. Uh, you will see the small temp table later on. So I have in this uh, temp table called chunks with all ID and product ID and the chunk number and the cluster index with the chunk number as the leading uh, column. And I fill it up by getting all the keys from my table and doing an integer division by the chunk size. Inserting them there. Then I set up a cursor over all the distinct chunk numbers in that temp table. Keep on looping as long as I get chunk number back from the cursor, and then I run my update statement, set unit price equals the unit price times 1.2, where exists, select, start from chunks, where chunk number equals a chunk node, and then or ID equals or ID, product ID equals product ID. And yeah, here are some important things to point out. Now look here, so this clustered index has chunk number, or ID, and product ID, and that was also what I used in row number. This means that down in this join, I'm addressing a continuous set of rows in big details, physically speaking. And 
This is important because the optimizer has has uh, has optimizations for this. I also made a uh, uh, test with this where I set up the chunks table in such a way that all the rows were scattered, all the rows in the chunks were scattered all over the table, and this ran about well, three times slower than this did. So this is a pattern to stick to. Make sure that the chunks you have in your temp table aligns with the with the physical organization of the table you're you're working with. Now, when I tested this, it ran about 1.3 to 5.6 times slower than the triple top loop, so it was certainly a cost for it. I like to point out that the result, if you would try this on the road, you could get quite different results depending on the profile of your table and all the other things. I would believe, I didn't uh, investigate this very closely, but I would assume that this, when I got this 5.6 times, times slower, it was because for that particular chunk size, um, the plan was not the best one for that chunk size. Because that is, the, chunk, the plan should probably not be the same for a chunk size of 1,000 or 6 million rows. Uh, but anyway, well, no matter what, we are certainly sacrificing efficiency for simplicity in this case. There's no discussion about that, but this is a lot simpler. So this was the big temp table. And well, that's a few things we can point out about this. I mean, as you might have realized, this the temp table has as many rows as there is in the actual table. But it's narrower, so it's not as big, but it's still quite big because it has still many rows. If there are, well, 100 million rows in the actual table, well, the big ten table will also have 100 million rows. But it will be smaller because it's only the index keys and the chunk number. And of course, it requires a full scan to fill it, which means that you might block writers and there could be other problems for doing that. So obviously, no, the big ten table is not always a good solution. But I still like to show you this because I think it's a viable technique. Not the least because it's simple to write and implement. So you can be confident that you did it right. But <clears throat> the alternative is to use a small temp table, which only, where you only fill up one chunk at a time. This is a little more complex, but it's leaner than the bigger temp table. So let's look at this. I got some variables here, and they got different, slightly different names than before. Well, they have different names because they work, well, somewhat differently. So that's a current or, current or ID and the last product ID. And then there's a row count, which initializes to the chunk size, my temp table, it's only the order ID and the product ID this time. And I start with setting current order ID as the min smallest order ID minus one, which means that this one doesn't matter because we don't have an order at this point. I keep on looping as long as my row count is equal to the chunk size. I truncate my temp table. Well, it's, it's empty on the first iteration, but I like to initiate variables and all that, that sorts of things at the beginning of my loops. Then I fill it up with a top query. So say top, a chunk size where order ID from big details, where order ID is equal to current order ID and product ID is greater than last product ID. Because you see, it is actually really the upper boundary for the previous chunk. And also then order ID is greater than, than uh, order ID. I capture the row count in this variable. Then I do my update. And again, keep in mind that here we have a contiguous set of rows or adjacent set of rows in the big details table. So it's efficient. And then I capture what was the upper boundary of this chunk with this top one query where I get already ID, ID descending and the product ID descending. So this means that's why they are slightly different from before. Now, when I tested this compared to the tripod top loop, well, between 1.3 to 3 point times slower, and compared to the big table, well, between, well, sometimes five, even up to five times faster and sometimes a little slower. And again, well, the profile of table is going to affect how it's going to work out, but you would choose something similar to this. It will be difficult to beat the triple top loop. That is faster, but it's also more difficult to get right. Um, yeah, this was the same script we looked at before. I just like to remind, uh, point out that you, you might want to look into this if you make it the download. There are a few more procedures and there's also some performance data from my test in case you're curious. Now let's leave performance behind and talk about application impact. If you don't do it in a chunky at all, well, everything is one single operation, which means that the application and the users, well, will see nothing at all of that operation or the complete result of it. Well, unless, God forbid, using no look. No, no, you don't do that, please. But if you do chunky, now, how will the application behave if the data is just halfway processed? And how will users react if they only see, wait a minute, this, what happened here? The data is, I can't get this in sync. Well, what is this? So, and this is even more pronounced if the operation will be interrupted and not moving at all for a while. That, and that could be by accident or it could be by purpose because maybe it's a large thing and you can only run it at night and it has to run for a couple of nights before it has completed. 
Now, all depending on the operation. Or maybe you can shrug your shoulders because it doesn't matter. For, ans- for instance, you have, a- you have added a new column to a table which you are initializing, but you're not exposing it anywhere. So maybe you don't have to bother at all. But it could also be that you have to make substantial changes to the application to reflect this. And this is particularly true if you already have an operation in place which you think this is causing too much problems and you want to break it up in chunks. You probably have to make a thorough analysis of how this affects the rest of the application. Now let's talk about resuming chunking. That is, your chunking operation is running and then it stops. Either because you told it to, I'll only run this between two and five o'clock in the morning, or because, well, the server crashed or whatever. And I like to discuss this by looking at five canonical operations. Oh, sorry, four canonical operations, not five. Five is just the number of the script. So first of all, I've got a purge operation here. And before I go and talk about resuming, I actually, this is one more pattern of doing chunking. So I got this big trans table and I want to purge all rows only by tra- uh, transaction date. You might recall that I told you there's no index on this table with transaction date as a leading column. So we can't just say delete top chunk size with transaction date later than purge date. That would just be just as bad as that operation we had in the beginning. So what I'm doing is here, I'm saying getting the transaction ID and I'm numbering the chunks by doing row number in integer division, but I'm not collecting all these IDs in the temp table. No, I because this is just one single ID. So what I do is I get the min ID and the max ID for these, group by chunk number, and then I run a cursor. So that saves me some memory. Or saves, saves me some disk, disk space in the temp B. And then I open my cursor, keep a looping, and this is a very simple delete operation. But let's now talk about, now what if this operation is interrupted halfway through at some, at some point? What should we do? Well, just restart it. I mean, what has been deleted has been deleted. No problem. Now, this here is the insert operation we looked at before. We're copying data from big trans to new trans. Now, if this, one's, if this one is interrupted halfway through, can we just simply restart? No, 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 we can't because it's going to start from the beginning and we will get a primary key violation. No, no, so we can't, we can't do that. But there's a very simple fix. We can just simply, when we set min ID, first peek in new trans, and if there is already some data in it, we can just say max transaction ID plus one, and keep on moving. Great fun. So um, here is update absolute, and this is the situation we've have added a new column to a table, which we are now initializing. And here I'm using dynamic scale, just in well, in what, with what I say before. Now, if this one crashes halfway through, what can we do now? Can we restart? Absolutely, no problem, because we're assuming that we, we will always set this sub value will be the same, even if this is actually a subquery or comes, comes from some other. But of course, we will, we, 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 we will be redoing work. So, well, we can save this a little bit by adding this condition, assuming that we, we will never set new column to null. But we can speed it up even further by just saying that, wait a minute, select min ID, well, Maybe we should add when new column is null, so we start at the right chunk size from the beginning. And now we have update price simple. This is a relative update, the one we looked at before, where I'm updating the price by multiplying with 1.2. Now, if this one crashes halfway through, what do we know now? Think about that for a second while I have some water. Well, is there any other choice but but restoring a backup? Huh, well, there could be something magic about these prices, but no, that's not very likely. So we absolutely need something better here. So here comes update price resumable. So when we enter this for the first time, we find that this table guest.lastid does not exist. So we create it. And this is a one row, one column table, where, which we initialize with by putting the smallest order ID in big details minus one. And then we come out with that, we take min ID as last ID plus one, well, doing our regular top loop, forgetting about the order ID this time, yes. And then we start the transaction, update the big details, and we save max ID into guest last ID. So now, if, oh, poof, we interrupt it. Well, we can just pick up where we were from this table very quickly and restart, and then we complete eventually and we will drop this table. Now, you might wonder, what is this guest dot? Well, guest is just a schema that exists in every database, which you can't drop. And well, this, I like to put it there because I think this is a kind of a temporary table. And I say a kind of temporary table. It's not one that lives in temp to be because it must survive server starts. So it must be in the database itself. But because it's not a regular table, I like to keep it away from the other tables 
so not have it in the Biao. But maybe I'm just overly fancy. You don't have to put it in guest. That is up to you. But now let's look at this idea a little more for the, for the other operations. So if, if we take this update price, update absolute, which we looked at. Now let's say that this, I've added this column to this extremely big table, and I can only run this initialization between two and three o'clock in the morning. That's the only hour at night where the system is, well, idle enough so I can do this. And let's say that this, th this takes five minutes to run. It's kind of a waste, isn't it, to spend five of those 55 minutes of finding the starting point. So maybe then it would be better to materialize that in a simple, small table so I can start up. And then maybe it would complete in eight days rather than nine days. And the same goes for this purge operation over here. Let's say that this one can only run between two and three o'clock in the morning. And well, then maybe this one takes five minutes to run. So maybe why should I run this every time if I still roast in the table or still or, or roast the process? So I can materialize these min and max IDs in the in a table permanent in the database. So if there is data, I guess could just okay, here is where I was, start operating and deleting those chunks. And if I run out of, of chunks before my hour has ended, I can fill it up again and so on. So this is a gen ID to re, to reuse. So let's go back to the slides and look at the alternatives. Well, first of all, you can just re ignore and start over. And that with purchase, that works very well. And it also works with absolute updates. But you will redo work. It might be that that could be a logic in your operation that quickly helps you to find out where you were. For example, find the last row you last inserted. Or, but if that doesn't work out, add a help table, help table to track where you are, to track where you are, not in temp2b, but in the database itself. But if nothing else helps, you haven't planned ahead, well, this is where you will end up, restoring a backup. And now keep in mind, here I looked at four simple canonical operations. Now in real life, the operation you're looking at might be a lot more complex. Maybe you're calling a store procedure that operates from input in the table, and you don't really know what that procedure does. The more things that are evolved, the more likely you will not know, can I restart here or not? Is that safe? So if you don't plan ahead, you will end up doing this, restoring your backup. So, well, depending on the operation, if it's something you're going to do, you know that you're going to restart because it's part of the application, you would use a help table or something else. But if you, oh, it's a one-time thing, maybe you don't code for it, but at least you have a plan. If this happens, we can do this to restart. That's a great idea. Well, there is actually one more alternative. If we just do the chunking inside a transaction, that's not a problem if it's interrupted. Everything will be rolled back and we can just start over. Now, wait a minute, this is completely crazy. I mean, we introduces this chunking to get rid of the problem with the transaction log. So why would we do this? You, Because that could be a reason to do, do chunking, which does not apply to transaction log. What I haven't mentioned, the main problem could be you have a query plan where the performance is not going linearly. So for instance, well, let's say 1,000 rows takes 50 milliseconds. Well, 10,000 rows, that takes two seconds. 100,000 rows takes 40 seconds, etc. Or it grows linearly to some point, but then it starts to spill to disk and you get problems. Uh, but wouldn't the best thing be to address the query? Yes, but for some reason or another, it may not be feasible. And yes, I have been in this situation. It happened to me. The customer complained, we were, well, we had a procedure that was um, levying a, a customer fees from accounts. And the procedure sent in 140,000 rows to one a general to procedure to create transactions, doing lots of updates. Inside that procedure, there was a join between two table variables, optimized for one row in each table. Oh, that plan was not good for very many rows. So I looked at this, and this procedure all is used in lots of parts of the system, and that query had been there for 15 years. No, I did not have the guts to start playing with it. So what I did was, in the outer procedure, splitting up in 10,000, chunks of 10,000 rows at a time, and I did that inside of the transaction because in my case, if I'd done it outside of the transaction, the application impact would have been huge. I would have had a lot of work to do to handle that. Now, the risk for bugs. We should not overlook this. I mean, chunking is not extremely difficult, but it adds increased complexity. And if, well, you know, you're coding like sitting half asleep like this with your keyboard, well, well, you could introduce all sorts of silly bugs, like skipping a row between chunks, or process the same row in two chunks, or miss the last two rows, or anything like that. So, I recommend that you test on a small data set with different chunk sizes, like the last chunk full minus one, the last chunk exactly full, the last chunk just a single row, etc. 
Because yes, I showed you a generic pattern, but I know you will deviate from that pattern every once in a while because it will make sense in that particular situation. Review your code, have someone else to re review it. And if possible, add assertions. For example, if you're copying rows from one table to a new table, well, check the row count at the end. Did I copy all rows? But it's not only checking for correctness, you also need to check for performance or test for performance. And here's, this is a big challenge. I mean, we talk about big tables, big databases. I did lots of tests. I restored the database for every test so I get, get, got a fresh, the same starting point every time. But if you're going to do that on a 10 terabyte database, I mean, that restore is going to take a long time, long time only that. So you can't really do this. There's so many things you can tweak these, these chunking stuff. So you more or less will have to make a choice on gut feeling, but you need to test that gut feeling to see that's good enough. And keep in mind, you're typically not looking for the very best top performance for your chunking operation. What you want to do is to stay clear from these disasters, where it takes, well, 1,700 whatever, or 4,300 whatever to do the operation. That is what you don't want to run into. And also, keep in mind, you not, should not only look at the execution time, you should also monitor how much space do I use in transaction log, how much does temp to be grow, etc. Now, the last thing I like to talk about is how we can use chunking for error handling. Sometimes all or nothing is not what we want. What do I mean by that? Well, let's say this. You have a file with four to 5,000 orders in it, which we like to read in, and that's come from, the, this file comes from an external source. So that could be orders, well, maybe some mandatory field is missing. That could be a product we no longer have, or a customer we are blacklisted. So we may not want to have all these orders in our database. But let's say four orders are bad. Of course, we, we still want the rest. We don't want to fail this because one order was bad. So our uh, process one order at the time then? No, we don't have to do that. We can divide the orders into chunks. And then if one chunk has an error, well, we, we would redivide that chunk into smaller chunks and retry. Keep on doing that. And eventually, a few orders will be processed on one by one basis, but only a few ones. And let's have a look at this. So this first script, I think I'm gonna start it right away, right? So make sure we don't have to wait for it. So this first script is just a simple play the loop one at a time. I got a start time when we start, how long I've been running, the row count I've been processed so far, and the current order ID and my cursor. So I set up a cursor on a table called new orders, four to 5,000 orders, there's also new details. Set up my cursor, have a try block, start a transaction, insert the big orders, insert the big details, and I commit my transaction, and if there's an error, well, I'll raise an error about that order. Here, I keep on incrementing the row count. And for every thousand rows, I print out a message. It's raised error, but it's level zero, so it's informative. But I do that with no weights to get the buffered output. And an output at the end, and eventually, I delete all the orders I inserted so that I can restart the test. And you can see here, here there was one order with problems, and one order more, and one order more. And I think there should be four in total. And it took, well, 33 seconds. Now let's look at the chunking operation to do this. So there's a slightly fewer variable. I've got a start time, how long I've been running, my chunk number, and my row count. And I got the temp table, and this is a big temp table with all the order IDs and numbered by chunk number, which I fill up here, inserting my temp orders, order ID, row number, minus one, integer division by 10,000. No longer using a parameter for the chunk size. The minus one is, well, that makes the demo a little prettier with all the chunks having the same size. And then I do my while block, as long as there's date and temp orders, this is not a cursor because I will add chunks to my temp orders table. And the entire while block is a, uh, is a while loop, is a, a try block, a try catch. And then I do, well, I get my chunk number for my temp orders table, the smallest one. I start a transaction, doing my inserted big orders and big details, and now lots of, of, uh, of all the orders in this chunk. I do my commit, a diagnostic message, how many I inserted, and I delete this, this one from the chunk orders table. Oh, from, sorry, from the template table. And here, this is what happened if there is an error in the chunk. So I wrote back the transaction, I get the current size of this chunk, and if the chunk size is bigger than one, well, then I want to redivide, redivide this chunk by this, here by the factor of 100, take the chunk size minus one, integral division by 100 and plus one, and I need to use the minus one so I don't get a chunk size of zero. That would be kind of silly. And then I'm redividing here, that, well, just printing out that I status message, and then I'm computing my new chunk number. So I'm doing a CT with the chunk number there, and the temp chunk was the row number, minus one, again, integral division by the new chunk size, 
And then you might think, here, okay, I got the CT to do this. I need to join back to my temple to stable. No, you don't need to do this. You might not have seen this before. Yeah, I thought this looks quite scary when I saw it the first time, but it's really smart. You can do an update on the CT itself. So I'm setting the chunk number two temp chunk plus my chunk number plus one. So that creates a new chunk. And if the chunk says was one, well, then I pick out which order to fail and I'll raise an error about that one and I'll delete that one from, from temp orders. And then there's a final output at the end. So, and then, and then also deleting all the stuff at the end there. So let's run this. And the first chunk, well, went fine. This one had problems. This one had problems. This one went fine. And this one also had some problems. And now we see smaller chunks here. This one again had problems. And we got lots of chunks with hundreds of orders in them. And then we have, well, that was one more apparently with some problems. And we keep on looping. Uh, keep, and now we got smaller chunks of 50 for the last chunk, which only had 5,000 orders, sorry, in it. And we keep on moving. Let's go to the end. And we can just scroll up and see here was one error message and there should be a few more if we go further up, which I'm going to skip. And we can look at the execution time and do this, well, 9.3 times, 9.3 seconds or 9.4 seconds compared to this. So it was an improvement, well, with a little more than a factor of three by doing chunking. So that, yeah, there was definitely a success. Now, one challenge when doing this is to find the initial chunk size. So if you pick the initial chunk size too high, so then about every chunk is going to error out to have, have a problem and row back. That will not be efficient. So how would you set the chunk size? Well, this is my rule of thumb, and this is not based on science. This is not based on tests. This is just based on common sense. So if you expect more than, well, one row out of n to error out, well, set the initial chunk size to n divided by 10. And of course, assuming no other limitations like having being nice to others. Now, how to determine on that? Well, if you... If this, this is something you do from scratch the first time, oh, gut fingling, stick a finger there, roll the dice, or whatever. If you already have an operation in place, then you maybe already have some data how common errors are. But anyway, you might want to monitor and maybe adjust the chunk size by time. Um, when redividing, well, again, I haven't studied this very carefully, but I would suggest by 100 or 1,000 at times, something like that, not by 10, that is probably too little. And now when we did this as one client, I owned up the spec and my, my colleague, he did the implementation and he went for a chunk size 1,000 initially. And then he said, okay, if this one fails, I go one by one. Uh, one thing also to consider now is the, if the errors are completely random or if they come in bursts, which are not unlikely because maybe the source of the data has a bad day or something like that. That can also affect the choice because if they come in bursts, you can probably have a bigger chunk size than if they are scattered. Well, I'm getting towards the end of my presentation, but I like to do a summary. So, chunking, something we all looked at, this is nothing you do every day. It's a trick you have in your toolbox for these really large operations to keep the transaction log and attempt to be in check and to avoid conflicts with the rest of the system. Uh, and when you're doing this for the really large operation, don't forget about the transaction log. And you may have to increase the backup frequency to make sure that you don't explode the log. Indexing is extremely critical. <clears throat> Your chunky must always follow an index, and preferably the clustered index, index, but sometimes it makes better to use another index, or you have to use another index. And repeating scans, well, it's extremely costly. You must, by all costs, avoid doing that. The top method that I showed you is a very generic way to drive the chunks. It works with any data type you can put an index on, and it even works with non-unique index, indexes to some extent. If you have multi-column keys, well, only care about the second level if you're really constrained to stay within the chunk size. And if you have to do this, well, defining chunks in the temp table is less efficient than extending the top method, but it's so much simpler, I would say, so I don't like it, that, that triple top loop. I guess it gives me, did I really get everything right there? I'm not sure. And don't forget to make interval variables known to the optimizer, either by using optional recompile for the bigger chunk sizes or sniffable with through dynamic SQL if you've got smaller chunk sizes. And if you're going to do an operation over the full table, it might be a good idea to do full scan to get good statistics for dynamic SQL. And don't forget to consider how the application may be affected by doing your chunking and how the users will be affected. It's something you need to think about. Uh, design your loops so you can restart where they were interrupted one way or another. At least have a plan for it. You don't want to restore the database, believe me. And if needed, create a help table to check where you were. And don't forget the test. For correctness, 
for performance. So I'm at the end more or less. My name is Alan Somersko. My email address is sql.somersko.se. And if you have questions about this session that you don't get answered now or during the live Q&A, you're more than welcome to mail me about this one. Oh, actually, that's one more thing I'd like to say. I have basically only scratched at the surface of this topic. There's so much more thing to discover about this one for all of us, for me and for you. Because I know, because I'm, when I run these tests, I made lots of revelations of things I haven't thought about before. So if you find something interesting, would you do this some chunky? Please drop me a line. I would like to know. Slides and scripts for this presentation is on my website, so let's go to se slash percent, and they should also be on the DPS site. And here's the URL if you want to play with the big DB. It's quite big, three, bit, three gigabyte download and expands to, expands to 20 gigabytes. And well, that is what I had to say from my slides, but I'd still also like to give a big thanks to Microsoft for supporting the Data Platform Geeks and SQL Server Geeks to making this event possible. And thank you for everyone, to you for listening and to the, well, for Data Platform Geeks to, for running this event. There's three ways you can win, win prizes. You can post your selfie with a hashtag. You can visit the sponsors and exhibitors and encourage you to do that because without the sponsors and exhibitors, this kind of event would not be possible. And for me, the most important is this, give session and conference feedback. And particularly sessions I like to know, and all other speakers like to know how they did. What could they do better? Please tell them. And also, DPS, the Data Platform Geeks, want to know, did they have the right speakers or not? So this concludes the recording, and we will now continue with the live Q&A. Thank you very much for listening so far.